Now we will change gears completely and we will talk about how we create great internet products. So this is almost a completely different presentation. And if you didn't like the first half, you probably won't like this either. Okay, there are many different ways to create products that are used by large companies in Silicon Valley. And we have a specific approach. And it's not this one. One of the most common approaches, and I've experienced it directly, is to let the loudest people in the room make the decision. The person who can stream the loudest, scream the loudest, with the most compelling voice, will be the one who influences the product decision. But the problem with that is that the volume, the sheer volume of influence from those people often outweighs the right insights about customers generally making good decisions. So there's another way you can do it. You can have some smart CEO that runs everything, that makes the great product decisions because they're truly visionary, they're truly brilliant. And there are some of those people, but not very many. And it might work if you have a visionary CEO like Apple had until recently. But if not, it probably doesn't work. So there's another mode that's far more popular and that we tend to use from time to time. And I would say most companies take advantage of this approach. And that is to listen to your customers. So here's an example of one of our customers at Netflix sending an email to our CEO saying, this is what you need to do if you want me to be a customer. It's a great service, but blah, blah, blah. A more sophisticated way to do that is to sit down in a room like this and put your products in front of people and then watch what they do with those products. See how they use them, see how they engage with them, see what they think of different product ideas. Both of those are flawed for this reason. People don't really know what they want. And you can see from my picture that I can, I can tell you all about that. So there is a much better way, which is to guide by behavioral data. And what that means is measuring people's behavior, the way they actually use the products, instead of their attitudes, instead of just making guesses, instead of any other methodology. And what that essentially involves, that's very core to how we approach product management at Netflix, is to A-B test things, to create different versions of the product you might want people to use, and then to see how they engage with it, to measure their behavior, and to let that be the guiding force in decision making. So here are some examples. Many of the companies in Silicon Valley, in fact, most of the consumer companies with any sort of data at scale use this technique to drive their products. Google in particular, Amazon is very much driven in this way, eBay as well, and then Yahoo perhaps to a lesser extent, very much within their search products but not across the board. And then as I've already mentioned, Netflix makes heavy use of this approach. So why is this a better way? Well, the metrics approach, it drives great focus that is hard to achieve without being data-centric. The decision-making becomes so much more objective than it might otherwise be. And it forces you to do something that's actually really hard, which is figure out the right metrics for your business. At Netflix, we have a couple of metrics. We have a simple business, which is just getting people to watch movies. So we can easily reduce it to metrics. And in our case, those metrics are visitor to trial conversion, which means if we get somebody interested in the product, we convert them into actually signing up. So if somebody signs up, they're interested enough to give us their credit card and get a free trial. We do everything we possibly can to get them to stick around. And then it's a little bit hard sometimes to measure those metrics. So we'll use what we call proxy metrics, and streaming usage is our best proxy metric. So the idea there is that if people are watching movies or TV shows, then they're getting value from the product. And if they're getting value from the product, then they'll probably stick around. And it's that behavior instead of the attitude that becomes powerful. The attitude would be, what do you think about Netflix? Oh, I think it's great. Did you stick around? No. It's not as valuable to use that attitudinal data as it is to use the behavioral data. It served us incredibly well at Netflix, and it's, played in, it's been a driver of the, the product development approach we've, we've chosen to adopt, which is to do the following. We hire really, really smart product innovators that know their space, that know their specific area of product innovation, and then we basically set them loose. We say, you've been hired to make this part of the product great, do it. We don't have any approval process. We don't have to sit down and say, should we do this or not? Is this a good idea or is this a bad idea? We just let them do it. And then we look at the data and we figure out what the data tells us about that idea. Was it in fact a good idea or was it a bad idea? If they have many good ideas, they do well. If they have many bad ideas, they find a new job. Um, oh, the last point. If, the other thing about this is that it fosters really deep customer understanding that's hard to get at otherwise because it's data and we're learning things and we have a discipline of trying to guess what will happen and then we learn from what actually happened. So I'll show you a few examples, just because it's fun to talk about this stuff. So the first one is a new website that we designed earlier this year. And all of these will be a little bit hard to see in the slides because I can't show you videos, you can't try the product, but you'll get the general idea. 
So this is what our website looked like circa the beginning of this year. Very much a product of a DVD-focused service. Small box shots, a lot of information, a lot of detail provided to help people choose the movie they might want to put in their queue and get in the mail. And the observation was that in a streaming world, there's not much information required to make a good viewing decision. All you really need to do is click play and watch it. So we restructured the site with very much with that in mind. More movies on the page, more compelling presentation of those movies, and less information about the movie. This little thing that you can't really read is about as much detail as we show people about the movie. So Feely doesn't, probably looks much the same, it's still red, it's still box shots, but generally it was a pretty radical change. And when you make a pretty radical change like this to a product that 25 million people use, you'll hear about it. This is what we heard. What was it? a school project created by a Netflix executive's nine-year-old kid. The new interface is utter rubbish. Please inform your employers that a drunken dyslexic monkey, that's my favorite one, would be a more acceptable design lead for your web projects. And then it gets even better. The new interface doesn't work, and not admitting your error is making you look like a bunch of jackasses. So I had a little bit of a stressful weekend. I was in charge of this project. My team member built it. And we were, we were in this period between rolling it out and hearing all of this feedback and not yet seeing the data. And I knew if the data was bad, well, I might need a new job. But I knew if the data was good, then we'd all be happy. So this is what happened. People watched more movies and less members canceled their subscriptions. So it was a resounding success in spite of what people had told us about how much they hated it and how brain dead we must have been to come up with a design like that. It's a huge win. So this is a good example of the kinds of lessons that come from driving with behavioral data. And in this case, the lesson was what people say and what they actually do, really not the same, often not the same at all. And in the case of a product like ours, the thing that we have to be cautious about to control for through the data is to not let that vocal minority, the few people who will really, really shout at the top of their lungs about something, get in the way of the silent majority. Millions of people happily watching more movies. You're not going to call and say, I like it more. You're going to call and say, I don't like. And that's why this type of approach really works well. I'll give you another example. So what, we are mostly a movie-focused service. And for a long time, we've had TV content, TV shows and series that we were worried were sort of disappearing within the site. People weren't finding that content. They weren't watching it. It wasn't working as hard as it could have been on the service. So we came up with a little promotion to try to get more engagement with that content. We created a version of that website that I just showed you that was very focused on TV shows, basically at the expense of movies. We figured we'd overcorrect for that. And then we said, well, whatever. We'll throw in a few other versions too, because testing's fun and it's cheap and it's a good way to learn. We created a version with a focus on kids, which is our second biggest genre. And we created a version with a focus on comedy, which was the next biggest. So it looked like this. This is the old website design, and it really looks like a small thing. But again, 25 million people, these are big things. And we changed it to look like, oh, this was the TV-focused one. It's all TV content. In this case, the Wizards of Waverly Place. That might have been part of the problem. In the, uh, in the kids-focused version, we had a whole page with nothing but content for kids to watch. All kinds of shows, different ages, different genres that are very kid-focused. And what we thought would happen is that the TV content would do really well, and we thought the kids' stuff was just a throwaway thing. But what happened was the TV-focused approach did nothing. It was what we would say is flat. It made no difference to behavior. It turned out people already knew about content, in spite of us guessing that they didn't. And the kids' version increased streaming and improved retention. So there was a surprising win there around something we'd sort of thrown in just as a bit of a freebie. Um, so what we did was hire a VP from Disney to run a kids-focused site experience. And we shifted a little bit our product strategy to really explicitly go after the kids' experience, to make kids' viewing and setting up movie streaming for your kids a core part of the Netflix value proposition. And this is what it looks like. We just rolled this out actually today on the Wii, which is a very kid-centric device. Looks like this press about it today, it's all good fun. So the lesson in this case was that that behavioral testing using the data can uncover some pretty surprising insights. On our own, without the data, we wouldn't have gotten to this insight, we wouldn't have done this. One more example. So the PS3 is a really substantial, significant device within Netflix. It's a place that a lot of people do their streaming. It's a thing that's connected to your TV. It's super powerful in terms of processor and memory and what have you. And it's, it's sort of an entertainment-focused device. So a little while ago, 
we had an opportunity to try some different versions of the PS3 experience. And this is, I'll tell you a little bit more about each of them, but we did something a little bit unusual. We built four completely different versions of the product experience, and we tried them all against each other. So what happened was a member would sign up and activate their PS3, and they'd get one of these four just randomly. That's what A-B testing is all about. And then we'd see what happened. And maybe they'd talk to their friends and notice it was different, but mostly they wouldn't. Mountains. So this is what, a common criticism of the approach I'm telling you about is that it's very incremental, which is to say you're scaling the mountain and all you're doing is focusing at the top of that peak, not looking a little bit further over and noticing that there's a much bigger mountain that you could be scaling. So this was an explicit attempt to say, forget about optimizing the thing we have, try everything we can possibly think of that could be a better way to stream movies and see which of those ends up being the best. So these are the four just briefly. I was going to show you videos here, but... That tends to crash presentations, so I took the easy road. So this one's called Special, and we put a lot of energy into this one. The idea was movies on the right and a navigation panel on the left. You could dive through your movies. It's not dissimilar from probably what a um, video-on-demand solution might look like. I, I bet there are some of those in New Zealand. And then we had Plus, which was the simplest approach, really just rows of movies. You can go up, down, left, right, hit play, or search. That's all you can do. And we have an enormous amount of algorithm smarts in the background to come up with some of these rows. You can't see it, or you can just see it at the bottom, visually striking, mind-bending sci-fi and fantasy. So this is all about using algorithms to come up with recommendations. Then we had one that we called Video Merch. And the notion here was, if you're going to watch a movie, then what better thing than just to start the movie? So you fire it up and it starts playing. And it, tells, it gives you a row of movies along the bottom. It starts instantly. This is a screenshot of, of the movie playing, but the idea is we pick an interesting moment and we just start streaming that movie to you. You don't have to choose anything, and if we're smart and we picked well, then you're already watching a movie. There's no work to choose that movie. And then lastly, we tried one that we called Navigator. And Navigator was about comprehensive movie choosing. You could dig in, you could pivot, you could find an actor, see who they worked with, you could dig in on all different dimensions, really deep, comprehensive browsing of the catalog, far more sophisticated, far more complicated. So we had a little contest with our VPs and directors to see who could pick the winner of these, and if we had a little more time, we could try that here. But almost everybody got it wrong. And the winner was the simplest variant. Up and down, left and right, here are the movies, pick one. Was by far the winner here, which was a surprising insight, and another example of had we have just chosen, based on the theoretically smartest person, we would have chosen wrong. So the lesson here, again, was everybody gets it wrong, from the CEO on down to the product experts to the people building the product. And there's another little lesson here with this very specific product example, which is people systematically underestimate the value of simplicity. It almost always wins, in my experience. You build the simple thing, it works. You build it smartly, you give people very few choices, it just does the thing it's meant to do, it will win. It's a little bit, you might think of it as the way Apple builds products versus Microsoft. Apple's very explicitly sort of subscribes to this camp. Microsoft never seen a feature they didn't like. <laughs> All right, that brings me pretty much to the end. So just a couple of parting thoughts before Q&A. It's really an unprecedented time of innovation at the moment. And the innovation is just creating some huge opportunities around products online and as we heard earlier, around the small kinds of teams that can be used to create great products and to get them out in the marketplace. But it's only effective if you can understand your business, understand how to measure success in your business, and really be focused on the things that will move the needle. And that's all I have.